Then Denna turned and left the better streets behind. Soon there were fewer lights and tipsy revelers. The musicians gave way to beggars who called out or clutched at your clothes as you walked by. Lamplight still poured through the windows of nearby pubs and inns, but the street was no longer bustling. People clustered in twos or threes, women wearing corsets and men with hard eyes. These streets weren't dangerous, strictly speaking. Or rather, they were dangerous in a broken glass sort of way. No way. Broken glass won't go out of its way to hurt you. You can even touch it if you're careful. Some streets are dangerous as frothing dogs, where no amount of care will keep you safe. I was beginning to get nervous when I saw Denna stop suddenly at the mouth of a shadowed alley. She craned her neck for a moment, as if listening to something. Then... After peering into the dark, she darted inside. Much, uh, was this where she was meeting her patron? Was she taking a shortcut to a different street? Or was she simply following her paranoid patron's instructions to make sure no one followed her? I began to curse under my breath. If I followed her into the alley and she saw me, it would be obvious I'd been trailing her. But if I didn't no follow her, I'd lose happen. her. And while this wasn't a truly dangerous part of the like city, I didn't want to leave her walking alone so late at night. So I scanned the nearby buildings and spotted one fronted with crumbling fieldstone. After a quick glance around, I climbed the face of it quick as a squirrel, another useful skill from my misspent youth. Once I was on the roof, it was a simple matter to run over the tops of several other buildings, then slink into the shadow of a chimney before peering down into the alley. There was a sliver of moon overhead, and I expected to see Denna striding quickly along her shortcut, or having a hushed and hidden meeting with her dodgy patron. But what I saw was nothing of the sort. Dim lamplight from an upstairs window showed a woman splayed out motionless on the ground. My heart thudded hard for several beats until I realized it wasn't Denna. Got the exercise? Denna was Even dressed in shirt and pants. This woman's white dress Even was crumpled around her, her bare pain. legs pale against the dark stone of the street. My eyes darted around until I saw Denna outside the window's light. She stood close to a broad-shouldered man with moonlight shining on his bald head. Was she embracing him? Was this her patron? Finally, my eyes adjusted enough that I could see the truth. The two were standing very close and still, but she wasn't holding him. She had one hand hard against his neck, and I saw white moonlight glitter on metal there like a distant star. The woman on the ground started to stir, and Denna called out to her. The woman climbed unsteadily to her feet, staggering a bit as she stepped on her own dress, oh, then edged that, slowly past them, keeping close to the wall as she made her way to the mouth of the alley. Once the woman was behind her, Denna said something else. I was too far away to make out any of the words, but her voice was hard and angry enough to raise the hair on the back of my arms. Denna stepped away from the man, and he backed away, one hand going to the side of his throat. He began to curse her viciously, spitting and making grasping motions with his free hand. His voice was louder than hers, but slurred enough that I couldn't make out much of what he said, though I did identify the word whore several times. But for all his talk, he didn't come anywhere close to within arm's reach of her. Denna simply stood facing him, her feet set squarely on the ground. She held the knife low in front of her, tilted at an angle. Her posture was See, almost casual. Take fights like that where almost. They just, like, push me one -on -one. After cursing for a minute or so, the man took half a shuffling step forward, shaking a fist. Denna said something and made a short, day. sharp gesture with the knife towards the man's groin. Silence time. filled the alley, oh, no. and the man's shoulders shifted a bit. Denna made the gesture again, just and the man began possible. to curse more softly, turning away and walking down the alley his hand still pressed to the side of his neck. Denna watched him go, then relaxed and slid the knife carefully into her pocket. She turned and walked to the mouth of the alleyway. I scurried to the front of the building. On the street below, I saw Denna and the other woman standing under a street lamp. In the better light, I saw the woman was much younger than I'd thought, just a slip of a girl, her shoulders heaving with sobs. Denna rubbed her back in small circles, and the girl slowly calmed down. After a moment, they began walking down the street. I hurried back to the alley where I had spotted an old iron drain pipe, a relatively easy way to get back down onto the street, 
but even so, it cost me two long minutes and most of the skin off my knuckles to get cobblestones back under my feet. Only through a pure effort of will did I keep myself from running out of the alley to catch up with Denna and the girl. The last thing I wanted was for Denna to discover I'd been following her. Luckily, they weren't moving very fast, and I caught sight of them easily. Denna led the girl back to the nicer part of the city, then took her into a respectable-looking inn with a painted rooster on the sign. I stood outside for a minute, peering at the layout of the inn through one of the windows. Then I settled my hood more firmly over my face, walked casually around the back portion of the inn, and slid into a seat on the other side of a dividing wall, just around the corner from Denna and the young girl. If I'd wanted to, I could have leaned forward to peer at their table, but as it was, neither one of us could see the other. The tap room was mostly empty, and a serving girl came up to me almost as soon as I took my seat. I don't know, just she eyed the rich fabric of my cloak I, and smiled. With everything, to be what can I get you? I eyed the impressive array of polished glass behind the bar. Casual. I motioned the serving girl closer and spoke softly with a rasp in my throat, as if I were recovering from the croup cough. I'll take a tumble of your best whiskey, I said, and a glass of fine Valoran red. She nodded and left. I turned my finely tuned eavesdropper's ears to the next table. Your accent, I heard Denna say. Where are you from? There was a pause and a murmur as the girl spoke. Since she was facing away from me, I couldn't hear what she said. That's in the Western Feral, isn't it? Denna asked. You're a long way from home. There was a murmuring from the girl, then a long pause where I couldn't hear anything. I couldn't tell if she'd stopped talking or if she was speaking too quietly for me to hear. I fought the urge to lean forward and peer at their table. Then the murmuring came back, very soft. I know he said he loved you, Denna said, her voice gentle. They all say that. The serving girl set a tall wine glass in front of me and handed me my tumble. Two bits. Merciful Taylor. With prices like that, no wonder the place was nearly empty. I tossed back the whiskey in a single swallow, fighting the urge to cough as it burned down my throat. Then I drew a full silver round out of my purse, set the heavy coin on the table, and put the empty tumble down over the top of it. I motioned the serving girl close again. I have a proposal for you. I said oh, quietly. Shit. Right now, I want nothing more than to sit here quietly, drink my wine, and think my thoughts. I tapped the overturned tumble with the coin underneath. If I am allowed to do this without interruption, all of this, less the cost of my drinks, is yours. Her eyes went a little wide okay. at that, darting down to the coin again. But if anyone comes over to bother me, even in a helpful way, even to ask if I would like anything to drink... I will simply pay and leave. I looked up at her. Where's this guy with the charger rifle? Can you help me get a little privacy tonight? She nodded eagerly. Found him. Thank you, I said. She hurried away and went immediately to another woman standing behind the bar, making a few gestures in my direction. Force him to get closer. I relaxed a bit, reasonably certain they wouldn't be drawing any attention to me. I sipped my wine and listened. Does your father do? Denna asked. I recognized the pitch of her voice. It was the same low, gentle shot. tone my father had used when talking to skittish animals, a tone designed to calm someone and set them at their ease. The girl murmured, and Denna responded, That's a fine job. What are you doing here, then? Another murmur. Got handsy, did he? Denna said matter-of-factly. Well, that's the nature of eldest sons. The girl spoke up again, this time with some fire in her voice, though I still couldn't make out any of the words. I buffed the surface of my wine glass a little with the edge of my cloak, then tipped it out and away from me a bit. The wine was so Newcastle deep a red that it was almost black. Stupid. It made the side of the glass act like a mirror. Not a wonderful mirror, but I could see tiny shapes at the table around the corner. I heard Dennis sigh, cutting off the low murmur of the girl's voice. Let me guess, Denna said, sounding exasperated. You, you stole the silver, or something similar, then ran off to the city. The small reflection of the girl just sat there. 
But it wasn't like you thought it would be, was it? Denna said more gently this time. I could see the girl's shoulders begin to shake and heard a series of faint, heartbreaking sobs. I looked away from the wine glass and set it back on the table. Here. There was the sound of a glass being knocked onto the table. Drink that, Denna said. It will help a bit. Not a lot, but a bit. The sobbing stopped. The girl gave a surprised cough, no, like choking a little. Stay warm. You poor silly thing, Denna said softly. Meeting you Why is worse so than looking in a mirror. For the first time, the girl spoke loudly enough for me to hear her. I thought, if he's going to take me anyway and get it Play for free, on, I might as well go somewhere I can pick and choose and get paid for it. Her voice trailed off until I couldn't make out any words, leaving only the low rise and fall of her muffled voice. The Tenpenny King? Denna interrupted incredulously, her tone more venomous than anything I'd ever heard from her before. Kissed and Crail, I hate that goddamn play. Modegan fairy story trash. The world doesn't work like that. But, the girl began. Denna cut her off. There's no young prince out there, dressed in rags and waiting to save you. Even if there were, where would you be? You'd be like a dog he'd found in the gutter. He'd own you. After he took you home, who would save you from him? A piece of silence. And the girl coughed do do? again, but only a little. I mean, so what are we going to do with you? When I'm Dennis said. Much every day. The girl yeah, sniffed man, and said no something. If you could take care of yourself, we wouldn't be sitting here, Dennis said. A murmur. It's an option, Denna said. They'll take half of what you make, but that's better than getting nothing and having your throat slit on top of it. I'm guessing you figured that out yourself tonight. There was the sound of cloth on cloth. I tipped my wine glass to get a look, but all I saw was Denna making some indistinct motion. Let's see what we have here, she said. Then there came the familiar clatter of coins on a table. The girl made an awed murmur. No, I'm not, Denna said. It's not so much when it's all your money in the world. You should know by now how expensive it is to make your own way in the city. A murmur that rose at the end. A question. I heard Denna draw a breath, then let it out again slowly. Because someone helped me once when I needed it, she said. And because if you don't get some help, you'll be dead in a span of days... Take it from someone who's made her own share of bad decisions. There was the sound of coins sliding on the table. Okay, Denna said. First option, we get you apprenticed up. You're a little old and it will cost, but we could do it. Nothing fancy, weaving, cobbling. They'll work you hard, but you'd have your room and board, and you'd learn a trade. A questioning murmur. Oh, shit. With your accent? Denna asked archly. Okay, dude, I can't can you curl a lady's hair, I can't hear, I can't, paint her I face, hear a mend her dress, tat lace? A thing. pause. No, no I don't even know what that is. you don't have the training to be a maidservant, and I wouldn't know who to bribe. We did become pro -haste. The sound of coins being gathered together. Here. Option two, Dennis said. We get you a room until that bruise is gone. Coins sliding. Then buy you a seat on a coach back home. More coins. Oh, you shave with a razor? You've been gone a month. That's the perfect amount of time for some serious worry to set in. When you come home, they'll just be happy you're alive. Hell Murmur. No. Tell them whatever you like, Razor? Dennis said. But if you've got no, half I'm a brain in your head, you'll make it sensible. I just take Nobody's going to believe you met like some prince who sent you home. A murmur so soft, I could hardly hear it. Of course it will be hard, you silly little bint, Dennis said sharply. They'll hold it over your head for the rest of your life. Folk will no, whisper when you walk by on the street. I've, I've It'll be hard to find a husband. Life, you'll lose like, friends. But that's the price you'll have to pay if you want to have anything like your normal life back again. Reap, the coins 25. clinked the as they were gathered Reap. together again. So much, Third option. If you're certain you uh, want to make a go of whoring, we can arrange it so you don't end up dead in a ditch. You've got a nice face, but you'll need proper clothes. Coins sliding. And someone to teach you manners. More coins. And someone else to get rid of that accent of yours. Coins again. Murmur. Because it's the only sensible way to do it, Denna said flatly. Another murmur. Denna gave a tight, irritated sigh. 
Okay. Your father's There's stable master, right? What are you talking about? Think about the different horses the Baron owns. Plow horses, carriage horses, hunting right, so horses. Like, excited murmur. It's a long process. It's hard to... Exactly, to though, Dennis short, said. Okay. So if you had to pick, what sort of horse would you want to be? A plow horse works hard, but does it get the best stall, Very the best feed? The guns that I've been murmur. In this building. That's right. That goes to the fancy horses. They get petted and fed and only have to work when there's a parade or someone goes hunting. Denna continued. So if you're going to be a whore, you do it smart. You don't want to be some dockside drab. You want to be a duchess. Here. You want men to court you, send you gifts. Murmur. Yes, gifts. If they pay, they'll feel like they own you. You saw how that turned out tonight. You can keep your accent and that low bodice and have sailors paw you for a half penny a throw. Or you can learn some manners, get your hair done, and start entertaining gentlemen callers. If you're interesting and pretty and you know how to listen, men will desire your company. They'll want to take you dancing as much as take you to bed. Then you have the control. Nobody makes a duchess pay for her room in advance. Nobody bends a duchess over a barrel in an alley, then kicks out her teeth once really? he's had his fun. Those were on Murmur. Him, but whatever. No, Dennis said, her voice grim. There was the sound of coins being clinked softly into a purse. Don't lie to yourself. Even the fanciest horse is still a horse. That means sooner or later you're going to get ridden. The heels for this situation. A questioning murmur. Then you leave, Dennis said. If they want more than you're willing to give, that's the only way. You leave quick and quiet in the night, but if you do, you'll burn your bridges. That's the price you pay. A hesitant murmur. I can't tell you that, Dennis said. You need to decide what you want for yourself. You want to go home? There's a price. You want control over your life? There's a price. You want the freedom to say no? There's a price. There's always a price. There was the sound of a chair being pushed away from a table, and I pressed myself back against the wall as I heard the two of them stand up. It's something everyone has to figure out on their own, Dennis said, her voice growing more distant. What do you want more than anything else? What do you want so badly you'll pay anything to get it? I sat for a long time after they left, trying to drink my wine. Chapter seventy three Blood Where did and people Ink land in, this map? in the Theophany, Tecum writes of secrets, calling them painful treasures of the mind. He explains that what most people think of as secrets are really nothing of the sort. Mysteries, for example, are not secrets. Neither are little known facts or forgotten truths. A secret, Tecum explains, is true knowledge actively concealed. Philosophers have quibbled over his definition for centuries. They point out the logical problems with it, the loopholes, the exceptions. But, the but in all this time, no, none of them has managed to come up with a better definition. That perhaps tells us more than all the quibbling combined. In a later chapter, less argued over and less well known, Tecum explains there are two types of secrets. There are secrets of the mouth and secrets of the heart. I don't know, I'm not really Most secrets are secrets of the mouth. I kind of just gossip the game. shared I don't really care too and much small about scandals <laughs> whispered. These secrets I mean, long to, to be let loose upon the world. I used to be a secret like, of the mouth is like a stone in your boot. At first you're barely aware like, of it. Really then it shit. grows no, irritating. Then intolerable. Secrets of the mouth grow larger the longer you keep them, swelling until they press against your lips. They fight to be let free. Secrets of the heart are different. They are private and painful, and we want nothing more than to hide them from the world. They do not swell and press against the mouth. They live in the heart, and the longer they are kept, the heavier they become. Tecum claims it is better to have a mouthful of poison than a secret of the heart. Any fool will spit out poison, he says, but we hoard these painful treasures. We swallow hard against them every day, forcing them deep inside us. There they sit, growing heavier, festering. Given enough time, they cannot help but crush the heart that holds them. 
Modern philosophers What's scorn Tekum, but they are vultures picking at the bones of a giant. Quibble all you like. Tekum understood the shape of the world. The day after I'd followed Denna through the city, she sent me a note, and I met her outside the Four Tapers. We'd met there dozens of times in the last several span, but today something was different. Today, Denna wore a long, elegant dress, not layered and high-necked in the current fashion, but close-fitting and open at the throat. It was a deep blue, and when she took a step, I could glimpse a long stretch of her bare leg beneath. Her harp case leaned against the wall behind her, and she had an expectant look in her eye. Her dark hair was lustrous in the sunlight, unadorned except for three narrow braids tied with blue string. No way. She was barefoot, you, and her feet were grass-stained. She smiled. You don't hit those, it's done, pussy. she said, excitement thrumming through her voice like distant thunder. Done enough to play you a piece at any rate. Building. Would you like to hear it? I caught a bit of well-hidden shyness in her voice. As we were both working for patrons who valued their privacy, Denna and I didn't often discuss our work. We compared our ink-stained fingers and bemoaned our difficulties, but only in vague ways. I'd like nothing better than to hear it, I said, as Denna picked up her harp case and started down the street. I fell into step beside her. But won't your patron mind? Denna gave a too casual shrug. He says he wants my first song to be something that men will sing for a hundred years, so I doubt he'll want me to keep it bottled up forever. She gave me a sideways look. We'll go somewhere private, and I'll let you hear. So long as you don't go shouting it from rooftops, I should be safe. We started walking to the western gate by unspoken agreement. That is, that is fact. I'd have brought my loot, I said, but I finally found a luthier I trust. I'm having that loose peg mended. You'll serve me best as an audience today, she said. Sit wrapped in admiration as I play. Tomorrow I'll watch you all dewy-eyed with wonder. I'll marvel at your skill and wit and charm. She moved her harp to her other shoulder and grinned at me. Provided you aren't having them mended at the shop. I'm always up for a duet, I suggested. Harp and loot is rare, but not unheard of. That's delicately phrased. She glanced sideways at me. I'll think on it. As I had a dozen times before, I fought the urge to tell her I'd reclaimed her ring from Ambrose. I wanted to tell her the story of it, mistakes and all, but I was fairly certain the romantic impact of my gesture would be diminished by the end of the story, where I'd effectively pawned the ring before I left Imre. Better to keep it a secret for now, I thought, and surprise her with the ring itself. So, what would you think, I asked, of having Pussy. Mayor Alvaron for your patron? Denna stopped walking and turned to look at me. What? I'm currently in his good graces, I said, and he owes me a favor, too. I know you've been looking for a patron. I have a patron, she said firmly, you one I've earned on my own. Like... You have half a patron, I protested. Where's your writ of patronage? Your master Ash might be able to give you some financial support, but the more important half of a patron is their name. It's like armor. It's like a key that opens. I know how a patronage works, Denna said, cutting me off. Then you know yours is shortchanging you, I said. If the mayor had been your patron when things went wrong at that wedding, no one in that shabby little town would have dared to raise their voice to you, let alone their hand. Even from a thousand miles away, the mayor's name would have protected you. He would have kept you safe. A patron can offer more than a name and money, Dennis said with an edge to her voice. I'm fine without the shelter of a title, and honestly, I'd be irritated if some man wanted to dress me in his colors. My patron gives me other things. He knows things I need to know. She gave me an irritated look as she flicked her hair over her shoulder. I've told you all this before. I'm content with him for now. Why not have both? I suggested. I don't know. The mayor in public I don't and your know. master Ash in secret. Surely he couldn't object to that. Alvaron could probably even look into this other fellow for you. Make sure he's not trying to win you with false. Denna gave me a horrified look. No! God, no! She turned to me, her expression earnest. 
Promise me you won't try to find out anything know. about him. It could ruin everything. Today, You're the yeah. only one I've told in all the wide world, but he'd be furious if he knew I'd mention him to anyone. I felt a bizarre glow of pride at this. If you'd really rather I not... Denna stopped walking and set her harp case down on the cobblestones, where it made a hollow thump. Her expression was deadly serious. Promise me. I probably wouldn't have agreed if I hadn't spent half the previous night following her around the city with the hope of discovering this very thing. But I had. Then I'd eavesdropped on her, too. So today I was practically sweating with guilt. I promise, I said. When her anxious look didn't evaporate, I added, Don't you trust me? There's no way that guy I'll swear it, like if that will set your mind at ease. What would that you swear it on? She asked, beginning to smile again. What's important enough that it will hold you to your word? My name and my power? I said. You are many things, she said dryly, but you are not Taberlin the Great. My good right hand? I suggested. Only one hand? She asked, playfulness creeping back into her tone. She reached out and took both of my hands in her own, turning them over and making a show of inspecting them closely. I like the left one better, she decided. Swear by that one. My good left hand? I asked dubiously. Fine, she said. The right. You're such a traditionalist. I swear I won't attempt to uncover your patron, I said bitterly. I swear it on my name and my power. I swear it by my good left hand. I swear it by the ever-moving moon. Den appeared at me closely, as if she wasn't sure if I was mocking her. Fine, she said with a shrug, picking up her harp. Consider me reassured. We started walking again, moving through the western gates and into the countryside. The silence between us stretched, starting to grow uncomfortable. Worried things would grow awkward, I said the first thing that came to mind. So, are there any new men in your life? Denna chuckled low in her throat. Now you sound like Master Ash. He's always asking after them. He doesn't think any of my suitors are good enough for me. I couldn't agree more, but decided it wouldn't be prudent to say so. And what does he think of me? What? She asked, confused. Oh, he doesn't know about you, she said. Why would he? Mary, so much I tried to give a nonchalant shrug, but I, I couldn't have been very been convincing as she burst out laughing. Pork both, I'm teasing you. I only tell him about the ones that come prowling around, panting and sniffing like dogs. You're not like them. You've always been different. I've always prided myself on my lack of panting and sniffing. Denna turned her shoulder and let her swinging harp bump me playfully. You know what I mean. They come and go with little gain or loss. You are the gold behind the wind-blown dross. Master Ash might think he has a right to know about my personal affairs, my comings and goings. She scowled a bit, but he doesn't. I'm willing to concede some of that for now. She reached out and took hold of my upper arm possessively. But you are not part of the bargain, she said, her voice almost fierce. You are mine. Mine alone. I don't intend to share you. The momentary tension passed, and we walked the wide west road away from Severin, laughing and talking of small things. Half a mile past the city's last inn was a quiet patch of trees with a single tall gray stone nestled in its center. We had found it while searching for wild strawberries, and it had become one of our favorite places to escape the noise and stink of the city. Denna sat at the base of the gray stone and put her back against it. Then she brought her harp out of its case and pulled it close to her chest, causing her dress to gather and expose a scandalous amount of leg. She arched an eyebrow at me and smirked as if she knew exactly what I was thinking. Nice harp, I said casually. She snorted indelicately. Uh, what's up, Claudia? I sat where I was, sprawling comfortably on the long, cool grass. I tugged a few strands of it out of the ground and idly began to twist them together into a braid. Honestly, I was nervous. 
While we had spent a great deal of time together over the last month, I'd never heard Denna play anything of her own creation. We had sung together, and I knew she had a voice like honey on warm bread. I knew her fingers were sure, and she had a musician's timing. But writing a song isn't the same as playing oh, one. What if hers wasn't any good? What would I say? Denna spread her fingers to the strings, and my worries faded to the background. I've always found something powerfully erotic about the way a woman puts her hands to a harp. She began a rolling gliss down the strings from high to low. Up, the sound of it was like hammers on bells, up, like water over stones, like bird song through the air. Oversight? She stopped yeah. and tuned a string. That one. Plucked, tuned. That one. She yeah. struck a sharp chord, a hard chord, a lingering chord then turned to look at me, flexing her fingers nervously. Are you ready? You're incredible, I said. I saw her flush a little, then brush her hair back to hide her reaction. Fool, I haven't played you anything yet. You're incredible all the same. Hush. She struck a hard chord and let it fade into a quiet melody. As it rose and like fell, she spoke the introduction to her song. Don't like that one either. I was surprised at such a traditional opening. Outlook? Surprised, oh, but pleased. I don't know, man. Old ways are best. Gather round and listen well, for I've a man. tale of tragedy to tell. I sing of subtle shadow spread across a land and of the man no the who turned his hand toward a purpose few could bear. Fair Lanre, stripped of wife, of life, of pride, Still do, do, never do, 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 from his purpose swayed, do, 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 who fought the tide and fell and was betrayed. At first, it was her voice that caught my breath. Then, it was the music. But before ten lines had passed her lips, I was stunned for different reasons. She sang the story of Mir Tarinial's fall, of Lanray's betrayal. It was the story I had heard from Scarpy in Tarbian. But Dennis' version was different. In her song, Lanray was painted in tragic tones, a hero wrongly used. Salitos' words were cruel and biting. Mere Terennial, a warren that was better for the purifying fire. Lanray was no traitor, but a fallen hero. So much depends upon where you stop a story, and hers ended when Lanray was cursed by Salitos. It was the perfect ending for a tragedy. In her story, Lanre was wronged, misunderstood. Salitos was a tyrant, an insane monster who tore out his own eye in fury at Lanre's clever trickery. It was dreadfully, painfully wrong. In the Kodic Despite Kodic this, part, it had it. the first Probably glimmers actually, of beauty but... to it. <clears throat> the chords well Wait, chosen, you know actually, uh... the rhyme subtle and strong. This song was very fresh. And there were rough Dude, patches of plenty, but I could feel the shape of it. I saw what it could become. It would turn men's minds. They would sing it for a hundred years. You've probably heard it, in fact. Most folk have. She ended up calling it the Song of Seven Sorrows. Yes, Denna composed it, and I was the first person to hear it played entire. As the last notes faded in the air... Denna lowered her hands, unwilling to meet my eye. I sat, still and silent, on the grass. For this to make sense, you need to understand something every musician knows. Singing a new song is a nervous thing. More than that, it's terrifying. It's like undressing for the first time in front of a new lover. It's a delicate moment. I needed to say something. A compliment. A comment. A joke, a lie, anything was better than silence. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't have been more stunned if she had written a hymn praising the Duke of Gibeah. The shock was simply too much for me. I felt raw as reused parchment, as if every note of her song had been another flick of a knife, scraping until I was entirely blank and wordless. <clears throat> I looked down dumbly at my hands. They What's still the held the half-formed guy? circle of green grass What's I'd been weaving when the song believer? began. It was a broad, Good flat plate baby. already beginning to curve into the shape of a ring. Still looking down, I heard the rustle of Denna's skirts as she moved. 
I needed to say something. I'd already waited too long. There was too much silence in the air. The city's name wasn't Mirinitel, I said, without looking up. It was not the worst thing I could have said, but it wasn't the right thing to say. There was a pause. What? Not Mirinitel, I repeated. The city Lanray burned was Mir Tyriniel. Sorry to tell you that. Changing a name is hard work. It will wreck the meter in a third of your verses. I was surprised at how quiet my voice was, how flat and dead it sounded in my own ears. I heard her draw a surprised breath. You've heard this story before? I looked up at Denna, her expression excited. I nodded, still feeling oddly blank, empty, hollow as a dried gourd. What made you pick this for a song? I asked her. It wasn't the right thing to say either. I can't help but feel that if I'd said the right thing at that moment, everything would have turned out differently. But even now, after years of thinking, I can't imagine what I could have said that might have made things right. Mm, Our excitement dude, faded banger, slightly. Bro. I found a version of it in an old book when I was doing genealogical research for my patron, she said. Hardly anyone remembers it, so it's perfect for a song. It's not like the world needs another story about Oren Velsiter. I'll never make my mark repeating what other musicians have already hashed over a hundred times before. Denna gave me a curious look. Human beings in a I thought I was going to be able to was surprise you with something being. new. I never was would have guessed you'd God. heard of Lanre. Was a God to a I heard it years ago, I said numbly, from an old storyteller in Tarbian. If I had half your luck... Maybe Denna shook her head in dismay. I had to piece it together out of a hundred little scraps. She made a conciliatory gesture. Me and my patron, I should say. He's helped. Your patron, I said. I felt a spark of emotion when she mentioned him. Hollow as I was, it was surprising how quickly the bitterness spread through my gut, as if someone had kindled a fire inside me. Denna oh, nodded. Dude, that's a banger. He fancies himself a bit of a historian, she said. I think he's angling for a court appointment. He wouldn't be the first to ingratiate himself by shining a light on someone's long-lost heroic ancestor. Or maybe he's trying to invent a heroic ancestor for himself. That would explain the research we've been doing in old genealogies. She hesitated for a moment, biting her lips. The truth is, she said, as if confessing something, I half suspect the song is for Alvaron himself. Master Ash has implied he's had dealings with the mayor. She gave a mischievous grin. Who knows? Running in the circles you do, you might have already met my patron and not even known it. My mind flickered over the hundreds of nobles and courtiers I'd met in passing over the last month, but it was hard to focus on their faces. The fire in my gut was spreading until my whole chest was full of it. But enough of this, Denna said, waving her hands impatiently. She pushed her harp away and folded her legs to sit cross-legged on the grass. You're teasing me. What did you think of it? I looked down at my hands and idly fingered the flat braid of green grass I'd woven. It was smooth and cool between my fingers. I couldn't remember how I'd planned to join the ends together to form a ring. I know it's got some rough patches, I'd actually agree with I heard Denna say, her voice brimming with nervous excitement. I'll have to fix that name you mentioned, if you're sure it's the right one. The beginning is rough, and the seventh verse is a shambles, I know. I need to expand the battles and his relationship with Lyra. The ending needs tightening, but overall, what did you think? Once she smoothed it out, it would be brilliant. As good a song as my parents Anger. might have written. But that just made it worse. My hands were shaking, uh, and I was bit, amazed at how hard it was to make them much. stop. I looked away from them, up at Denna. Her nervous excitement faded when she saw my face. You're going to have to rework more than just the name. I tried to keep my voice calm. Lanray wasn't a hero. She looked at me oddly, as if she couldn't tell if I was making a joke. What? You've got the whole thing wrong, I said. 
Lenray was a monster, a traitor. You need to change it. Denna tossed back her head and laughed. When I didn't join her, she cocked her head, puzzled. You're serious? I nodded. Denna's face went stiff. Her eyes narrowed and her mouth made a thin line. You have to be kidding. Her mouth worked silently for a moment. Then she shook her head. It wouldn't make any sense. The whole story falls apart if Lanray isn't the hero. It's not about what makes a good story, I said. It's about what's true. True? She looked at me incredulously. This is just some old folk story. None of the places are real. None of the people are real. You might as well get offended at me for coming up with a new verse for Tinker Tanner. I could feel words rising in my throat, hot as a chimney fire. I swallowed down hard against them. Some stories are just stories, I agreed. But not this one. It's not your fault. There's no way you could have... Oh, well, thank you, she said bitingly. I'm so glad this isn't my fault. Fine, I said sharply. It is your fault. You should have done more research. What do you know about the research I did, she demanded. You haven't the slightest idea. I've been all over the world digging up pieces of this story. That's a banger song, It was bro. the same thing my father had done. He'd started writing a song about Lanre, but his research led him to the Chandrian. He'd spent years chasing down half-forgotten stories it's and true. digging up rumors. I think I he guy. wanted his song to tell the truth about them, and they had killed my entire troop to put an end to it. I looked down at the grass and thought about the secret I had kept for so long. I thought of the smell of blood and burning hair. I thought of rust and blue fire and the broken bodies of my parents. How could I explain something so huge and horrible? Where would I even begin? I could feel the secret deep inside me, huge and heavy as a stone. In the version of the story I heard, I said, touching the far edge of the secret, Lanre becomes one of the Chandrian. You should be careful. Some stories are dangerous. Dennis stared at me for a long moment. The Chandrian? She said incredulously. Me, baby. Then she laughed. It was not her Cash usual delighted me. laugh. This was sharp and full of derision. Me. What kind of child are you? I knew exactly how childish it made me sound. Rarely. I felt myself flush hot Last with embarrassment, my, day, my whole body far. suddenly prickling with sweat. I opened my mouth to speak, and it felt like cracking open the door of a furnace. Last time I ever did one. I'm like a child, I spat. What do you know about anything, you stupid... Hey. I almost bit hey. off the end of my tongue to keep from shouting the word whore. You think you know everything, don't you? She demanded. You've been to the university, so you think I mean, the I rest of us are... Quit looking for excuses to be upset and listen to I me! Like I snapped. To of a the words ball. poured out of me like molten iron. You're having a snit like a spoiled little girl. Don't you dare. She jabbed a finger at me. Don't talk to me like I'm some sort of witless farm girl. I know things they don't teach at your precious university. Secret things. I'm not an idiot. You're acting like an idiot. I shouted so loudly the words hurt my throat. You won't shut up long enough to listen to me. I'm trying to help you. Denna sat in the center of a chilly silence. Her eyes were hard and flat. That's what it's all about, isn't it? She said coldly. Her fingers moved in her hair, every flick of her fingers stiff with irritation. She untied her braids, smoothed them out, then absentmindedly retied them in a different pattern. You hate that I won't take your help. You can't stand that I won't let you fix every little thing in my life, is that it? Well, maybe someone needs to fix your life. I snapped. You've made a fair mess of it so far, haven't you? She continued to sit very still, her eyes furious. What makes you think you know anything about my life? I know you're so afraid of anyone getting close that you can't stay in the same bed four days in a row, I said, hardly knowing what I was saying anymore. Angry words poured out of me like blood from a wound. I know you live your whole life burning bridges behind you. I know you solve your problems by running. What makes you think your advice is worth one thin sliver of a damn anyway? Denna burst out. 
Half a year ago, you had one foot in the gutter, hair all shaggy and only three raggedy shirts. There isn't a noble in a hundred miles of Imray that would piss on you if you were on fire. You had to run a thousand miles to have a chance of a patron. My face burned with shame at her mention of my three shirts, and I felt my temper flare hot again. You're right, of course, I said scathingly. You're much better off. I'm sure your patron would be perfectly happy to piss on you. Now we get to the heart of it, she said, throwing her hands up in the air. You don't like my patron because you could get me a better one. You don't like my song because it's different from the one you know. She reached for her harp case, her movements stiff and angry. You're just like all the rest. I'm trying to help you. You're trying to fix me, Denna said crisply as she put away her harp. You're trying to buy me, to arrange my life. You want to keep me like I'm your pet, like I'm your faithful dog. I'd never think of you as a dog, I said, giving her a bright and brittle smile. A dog knows how to listen. A dog has sense enough not to bite a hand that's trying to help. Our conversation spiraled downward from there. At this point in the story, I'm tempted to lie. To say I spoke these things in an uncontrollable rage, that I was overwhelmed with grief at the memory of my murdered family. I'm tempted to say I tasted plum and nutmeg. Then I would have some excuse, I listen to too much straight, but they bro. were my words. In the end, I was the one who said those things. E. Only me. Denna responded in kind, oh, hurt and furious and sharp-tongued as myself. We were both proud and angry and filled with the unshakable certainty of youth. We said things we never would have said otherwise, and when we left, we did not leave together. My temper was hot and bitter as a bar of molten iron. It seared at me as I walked all the way back to Severin. It burned as I made my way through the city and waited for the freight lifts. It smoldered as I stalked through the mayor's estates and slammed the door to my rooms behind me. It was only hours did, uh, later that I cooled I did, enough like, to regret a, my like words. With, um, I thought of what I might have said to Denna. I thought of telling her of how my Scott. troop was killed, about the Chandrian. Which was one of the coolest things I decided I'd done, I would write her music. a letter. I would explain it all, no matter how foolish or unbelievable it seemed. Is, I brought out pen and ink and laid a sheet of fine white paper on the writing that desk. Cool. I dipped the pen and tried to think of where I could begin. My parents had been killed when I was eleven. It was an event so huge and horrifying, like it had driven me nearly mad. In the years since, I had never told a soul of those events. I had never so much as whispered them in an empty room. It was a secret I had clutched so tightly for so long that when I dared think of it, it lay so heavy in my chest that I could barely breathe. I dipped the pen again, but no words came. I opened a bottle of wine, thinking it might loosen the secret inside me. Give me some finger hold I could use to pry it up. I drank until the room spun, and the nib of the pen was crusted with dry ink. Hours later, the blank sheet still stared at me, and I beat my fist against the desk in fury and frustration, striking it so hard my hand bled. That is how heavy a secret can become. It can make blood flow easier than ink. Chapter 74. Rumors. The day after I fought with Denna, I woke late in the afternoon, know, feeling feel like miserable for you, all like, the obvious reasons. Once you, like, I ate and bathed, people, but pride kept me from heading down famous. to Severin Low to look for Denna. I sent a ring to Braden, but the runner returned really with the news like that, that he was still away from the estate. So, I opened a bottle of wine and it's began cool. to leaf through the pile of stories that had been slowly accumulating in my room. Like, I won't, like, treat the majority of these were scandalous, spiteful things. But their petty meanness suited my mood and helped distract me from my own misery. Thus, I learned the previous Comte Banbride hadn't died of consumption, but of syphilis contracted from an amorous stable hand. Lord Veston was addicted to dinner resin, and money intended for the maintenance of the King's Road was paying for his habit. Baron Jackus had paid several officials to avoid scandal when his youngest daughter was discovered in a brothel. There were two versions of that story, one where she was selling and another where she was buying. I filed that information away for future use. 
I'd started a second bottle of wine by the time I read that young no Natalia Lackless had like run away with a troupe of traveling <laughs> performers. Her parents had disowned her, of course, leaving Mellowin the so only heir to the Lackless lands. That explained Mellowin's hatred of the Rue, and made me doubly glad I hadn't made my Adima blood public here in Severin. There were three separate stories of how the Duke Europe? of Cormacent oh, okay, flew into here. rages while in his cups, beating whoever happened to be nearby, including his wife, his son, and several yeah, dinner guests. There was a brief speculative account of how the king and queen held depraved orgies in their private gardens, hidden from the eyes of the royal court. Even Braden made an appearance. He was said to conduct pagan rituals in the secluded woods outside his northern estates. They were described with such extravagant and meticulous detail that I wondered if they weren't copied directly from the pages of some old yeah, another, A-Turin romance. Thing about famous people is that I read well into the evening and was only halfway through the stack of stories when I finished the bottle of wine. Like, like an I was just about to like send a runner for another when I heard the soft hush of air from the other hunters. room that announced Alvaron's entrance into my chambers through his secret passage. I pretended to look surprised when he entered the room. Good afternoon, your grace, I said as I came to my feet. Sit, if you wish, he said shortly. I remained standing out of deference, as I'd learned it was better to err on the side of formality with the mayor. How are things progressing with your lady? I asked. From Stapes's excited gossip, I knew matters were rapidly coming to a close. We pledged a formal troth today, he said distractedly, signed papers and all. It's done. If you'll forgive me for saying so, your grace, you don't seem very pleased. He gave a sour smile. I suppose you've heard about the trouble on the roads of late? Only rumors, uh, your Nick grace. He snorted. Rumors I have been fire. trying to keep quiet. Yes, Someone has been waylaying my tax collectors on the North Road. That was serious. Collectors, your grace? I asked, stressing the plural. And the fact How much that have they managed to take? Like, you guys, the you mayor gave me a stern look that let me know the impropriety of my question. Have, like, in? Enough. And the, the, the More little, like, than enough. This is the fourth I've had go missing. Yeah, that was that guy. Over half of my northern taxes taken by highwaymen. I, he gave me a sure. serious look. The me. lackless lands are in the north, you know. You think the lacklesses are waylaying your collectors? He gave me a stunned look. What? No, no. It's bandits in the Eld. I blushed a little in embarrassment. Have you sent out patrols, your grace? Of course I've sent out patrols, he snapped. I've sent a I'm dozen. So I can see that they haven't found guy. so much as a campfire. He paused and looked at me. I suspect someone in my guard oh, is in league with them. Artist, she, His expression was she, grave. Uh, I assume your grace has given your collectors escorts she, like, made to a piece, and, like, he said. Started making a name for Do you know how much it costs like, to replace a dozen guardsmen, yeah, armor, weapons, horses? He sighed. I'll, I'll show you guys On top of it all, only part of the stolen taxes are mine. Kind of music the rest own. belong to the like, king. My kind of music and her kind of music was completely I nodded in understanding. Well, I don't imagine he's very pleased. Alvaron waved a hand but, dismissively. Oh, Roderick will have his money regardless. He holds me personally responsible for his tithe. So I'm forced to send the collectors around again to gather his majesty's share a second time. I don't imagine that sits very well with most people, I said. It does not. He sat in an overstuffed chair and rubbed his face tiredly. I'm at my wit's end over the matter. How will it look to Malowin if I cannot keep my own roads safe? I took a seat as well, facing him. What of Dagon? I asked. Couldn't he find them? Alvaron gave a short, humorless bark of a laugh. Oh, Dagon would find them. He'd have their heads on poles inside ten days. Then why it's not send bad, him? Bro. Like, I, I asked, like, puzzled. I can't say too much it's because so Dagon is a man of straight lines. He would raise a dozen villages and set fire to a thousand acres of the Eld to find them. She's like really, he shook his head seriously. Really good at what she did. Even if I thought him suited to this task, really good at what she did, he is tracking down Cauticus at the moment. Besides, I believe there may be magic at work in the Eld, and that is outside Dagon's ken. 
I suspected the only magic at work was half a dozen sturdy Modegan longbows, but it's the nature of people to cry magic whenever they're faced with something they cannot easily explain, especially in Ventus. Alvaron leaned forward in his seat. Might I rely on your help in this? There was only one response to that. Of course, Your Grace. Do you know much woodcraft? I studied under a yeoman when I was younger, I exaggerated, guessing he was looking for someone to help devise a better defense for his collectors. I know enough to track a man and hide myself. Alvaron raised an eyebrow at that. Really? You are possessed of quite the diverse that. education, aren't you? I've led an interesting life, Your Grace. The bottle of wine I'd drunk made me bolder than usual, and I added, I've got an idea or two you might Isn't find weird, helpful in dealing with your bandit problem. Up. Like, my hands are still kind of cold. He leaned forward in his chair. Like cold, like Do tell. I, to be, but like I could devise cold. some arcane protection for your men. Crazy. I made a flourish with the long fingers of my right hand, hoping it looked sufficiently mystical. Yeah, I, think I, do the wrong thing. I juggled numbers in my head and wondered how long it would take to create an arrow catch using only the equipment in Caracas's tower. Alvaron nodded thoughtfully. That might suffice if I was only concerned for the safety of my collectors, but this is the King's Road, a major artery of trade. I need to be rid of the bandits themselves. I I like the wrong way. In that case, I said, I, be doing I would assemble here. a small group who know how to make their way quietly in a forest. They shouldn't have too much difficulty here. locating your bandits. When they do... It should be a simple matter to send your That's guard out to catch them. Probably, Loki. Easier yet to set an ambush and kill them, wouldn't you say? Alvaron said slowly, as if looking to gauge my reaction. Or that, I admitted. Your grace is the arm of the law. Death is the Dude, penalty I for banditry, especially on the so king's hard. road, Alvaron said firmly. What the Does that fuck? seem harsh to you? Not in the least. I said, looking him squarely in the eye. Safe roads are the bones of civilization. Alvaron surprised me with a sudden smile. Your Dude, plan is the very image of my own. I have gathered a handful of mercenaries to do just, just as you've suggested. I've had to move secretly, as I don't know who might be sending these bandits their warnings. But I've got four good men no, ready to leave over, tomorrow. A tracker, two mercenaries with some skill in the forest, and an ADEM mercenary. The last did not come cheaply, either. I gave him a congratulatory nod. You've already planned it better than I could, Your Grace. It hardly seems as if you need my help at all. Quite the contrary, he said. I still need someone with a little sense to lead them. No, 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 no. He looked at me meaningfully. Someone who understands magic. Someone I can trust. I felt a sudden sinking sensation. Alvaron got to his feet, smiling warmly. Twice now you have served me beyond all expectations. Are you familiar with the expression, third time pays for all? Again... There was only one reasonable answer to that question. Yes, Your Grace. Alvaron took me to his rooms, and we looked over maps of the countryside where his men had been lost. It was a long stretch of the King's Highway running through a piece of the Eld that had been old when Ventus was nothing more than a handful of squabbling sea kings. It was a little more than 80 miles away. We could be there in four days of hard walking. Stapes provided me with a new travel sack, and I packed it as well as I was able. I'm going to. I took a few McDonald's. of the more practical like clothes from minutes. my wardrobe, though they were still more suited for a mm -hmm. ballroom than the road. I packed away a few items I'd quietly pilfered from Codicus's lab over the last span, and gave Stapes a list of a few essential items I was lacking, and he produced them all more quickly than a grocer in a store. Finally, oh, at the hour God, when dude. all but the most desperate and dishonest persons are abed, Alvaron gave me a purse containing a hundred silver McDonald's bits. Like this McDonald's is a messy do, way of handling it, Alvaron said. I Normally, like I would give you a writ charging citizens month. to provide you with assistance and Japan. aid. Uh, no. He sighed. But using something like that as you travel would be as good as blowing a trumpet announcing I your arrival. I nodded. 
If they're clever enough to have a spy among your guard, it's safe to assume they have connections with the local populace as well, Your Grace. They might be the local populace, he said darkly. Stapes led me out of the estate through the same secret passage now, the mayor the used to enter my rooms. Carrying a hooded thief's lamp, he took me through several twisting passages, then down a long, dark stairway that bored deep into the stone of the shear. Thus, I found myself standing alone in the chill cellar of an abandoned shop in Severin Low. It was in the section of the city that had been ravaged by fire some years ago, and the building's few remaining roof beams stretched like dark bones against the first pale light of dawn. I stepped from the burned shell of the building. The no Above, the mayor's idea. estates perched on the edge of the shear like some predatory bird. I spat, none too pleased with my situation, press-ganged into mercenary service. My eyes were gritty from my sleepless night and my long journey through the twisting stone passages in the shear. The wine I'd drunk wasn't improving anything either. For the last few hours, I could feel myself growing less drunk and more hungover by slow degrees. I'd never been awake through the entire process before, and it was not pleasant. I'd managed to keep up appearances in front of Alvaron and Stapes, but the fact of the matter was that my gut was sour and my thoughts were thick and sluggish. The cool, pre-dawn air cleared my head a little, and within a hundred steps, I began thinking of things I'd forgotten to include on the list I'd given Stapes. The wine okay. had done me no favors there. I had no tinderbox, no salt, no knife. My loot. I hadn't picked it up from the luthier after having its loose peg fixed. Who knew how long I might be hunting bandits for the mayor? How long would it sit unclaimed before the man decided it had been abandoned? I went two miles out of my way, but found the luthier shop she's dark she's and lifeless. Like I somewhere. hammered on the door to no avail. Then, like I said, I after a wanna, moment's I wanna, indecision, wanna I broke in real. and I stole wanna, it. Like, be warm. Though it hardly seemed to be stealing, ice. since the loot was mine to begin with, and I'd already paid for the repairs. How can I be cold if I'm spicy? I had to climb a wall, force a window, and trip two locks. It was fairly simple stuff, but given my sleepless, wine-sodden head... I'm probably lucky I didn't yeah, fall off the roof and break my neck. But aside from a loose piece of slate that set my heart racing, things went smoothly, and I was back on my way in 20 oh minutes. My God, dude. There's no way that I'm the four mercenaries Alvaron had assembled were waiting in a tavern two miles north of Severin. We made brief introductions and left immediately, heading north on the King's Highway. My thoughts were so sluggish that I was miles north of Severin before I began to reconsider a few things. Only then did it occur to me that the mayor might have been less than completely honest in everything he had told me the night before. Was I truly the best person to lead a handful of trackers into an unfamiliar forest to kill a band of highwaymen? Did the mayor really think so much of me? No, of course not. It was flattering, but simply not true. The mayor had access to better resources than that. The truth was... He probably wanted his sweet-tongued assistant out of the way now that he had the Lady Lackless well in hand. I was foolish for not realizing it sooner. So he sent me on a fool's errand to get me out from underfoot. He expected me to spend a month chasing his wild goose in the deep forest of the Eld, then come back empty-handed. The purse made better sense, too. A hundred bits would keep us provisioned for a month or so. Then... When I ran out of money, I'd be forced to return to Severin, where the mayor would cluck his tongue in disappointment and use my failure as an excuse to ignore some of the favor I'd accumulated so far. On the other hand, if I got lucky and found the bandits, Damn. all the better. It was exactly the sort of plan I'd credit to the mayor. No matter what happened, he got something he wanted. It was irritating, but I could hardly go back to Severin and confront him. Now that I'd committed myself, there was nothing to do but make the best of the situation. As I walked north, my head throbbing and my mouth gritty, yeah, I, I decided I would surprise the mayor again. I'd hunt down his bandits. Then third time would pay for all, and Mayor Alvaron would be well and truly in my debt. Chapter 75 The Players over the next few hours of walking, I did my best to get to know the man Alvaron had saddled me with. 
I speak figuratively, of course, as one of them was a woman, and we were all five of us afoot. Tempe caught my eye first and held it the longest, as he was the first ADEM mercenary I'd ever met. Far from being the imposing, hard-eyed killer I'd expected, Tempe was rather nondescript, neither particularly tall nor heavily built. He was fair-skinned with light hair and pale gray eyes. His expression was blank as fresh paper. Strangely blank. Studiously blank. I knew ADEM mercenaries wore blood-red clothing as a sort of badge, but Tempe's outfit was different than I'd expected. His shirt was held tight against his body with a dozen soft leather straps. His pants, too, were belted tightly at the thigh and calf and knee. Everything was dyed the same bright and bloody red, and it fit him snugly as a gentleman's glove. As the day grew warm, I saw him begin to sweat. After living in the cool, thin air of the storm wall, the weather must have seemed disproportionately hot to him. An hour before noon, he loosened the leather straps of his shirt and peeled it away, using it to wipe the sweat from his face and arms. He didn't seem even slightly self-conscious about walking the king's highway naked to the waist. Tempe's skin was so pale it was almost the color of cream, and his body was lean and sleek as a coursing hound, his muscles shifting under his skin with an animal grace. I tried not to stare, but my eyes couldn't help but pick out the thin, pale scars that crossed his arms and chest and back. He never offered a word of complaint about the heat. Words of any sort seemed rare from him, and he responded to most questions with a nod or a shake of the head. He carried a travel sack like mine, and his sword, far from being intimidating, seemed rather short and unimpressive. Daydan was as different from Tempe as one man can be from another. He was tall, wide, and thick around the chest and neck. He carried a heavy sword, a long knife, and wore a mismatched set of boiled leather armor, hard enough to knock on and often mended. If you have ever seen a caravan guard, then you have seen Daydan, or at least someone cut from the same bolt of cloth. He ate most, complained most, swore most, and had a stubborn streak thicker a than a broad a oak plank. What is happening? But to be fair, he also had a friendly manner and an easy laugh. I was tempted to think of him as stupid due to his manners and his size, but Daydan had a quick wit when he bothered using it. Hespo was a female mercenary, Dude, a not god. as rare a creature as some folk think. No, man. In appearance and equipage, she was a near mirror of Daydan. The leather, the heavy sword, the slightly weather-worn and world-wise attitude. She had broad shoulders, strong hands, and a proud face with a jaw like a cinder brick. Her hair was blonde and fine, but cut short in the fashion of a man's. What? But to see her as a female version of Daydan was a mistake. I get a kill? She was reserved where Daydan was all bravado. And while Daydan had an easy manner when his temper wasn't up, Hespa had a vague hardness about her, as if she were constantly expecting someone to give her trouble. Martin was the oldest of us, our tracker. He wore a little leather, softer and better cared for than Daydan's or Hespa's. He carried a long knife, a short knife, and a hunter's bow. Martin had worked as a huntsman before falling out of favor with the baronet whose forces he attended. Mercenary work was a poor job by comparison, but it kept him fed. His skill with the bow made him valuable despite the fact that he wasn't nearly as physically imposing as either Daydan or Hespa. The three of them had formed a loose partnership some months ago and had been selling their services as a group ever since. Martin told me they'd done other jobs for the mayor, the most recent of which involved scouting some of the lands around Tinue. It took yeah, me about like ten minutes to realize Martin should be the leader of this expedition. So I have like, he had I more like woodcraft than all like, the rest of us put together, them, and, and had even hunted men for bounty once or twice. I, when I mentioned I this to him, he shook his head and smiled, telling me that being oh, able to do me. something and wanting to do it were two very different things indeed. Last was me, their fearless leader. The mayor's letter of introduction had described me as a discerning young man of good education and diverse Dude, no, useful qualities. Like While this was perfectly true, it also made me sound like the most wretchedly useless court dandy in existence. Not helping matters was the fact that I was younger than any of them by years and wearing clothes more suited for a dinner party than the road. 
I carried my loot and the mayor's purse. I wore no sword, no armor, no knife. I dare say they didn't quite know what to make of me. The sun was about an hour from setting when we passed a tinker on the road. He wore the traditional brown robe, belted with a length of nah, rope. Hungry, bro. I just want my he didn't have a cart, but let a single donkey so minutes. loaded with bundles of oddments that it looked like a mushroom. He made his slow way toward us, singing, driver that's literally If in... you need no mending and nothing needs tending, a wise bro, man will still Narnia, see the right bro. time for spending. Enjoy the sunshine, but though you might feel fine, yeah, driver, if you don't like stop now, away. you'll be filled with regret. It's better to simply pay no and prepare for here. a rainy day than think of I the tinker me. when you're dripping wet. I laughed and applauded. Bro, the driver's Proper so traveling far. tinkers are a rare breed of people, and I am always glad to see one. My mother told me they were lucky, and my father had valued them for their news. The fact that I was in desperate need of a few items made this meeting three times welcome. Oh, tinker! Daydan said, smiling. I need fire and a pint. How long before we hit an inn? The tinker pointed back the way he had come. Not twenty minutes walk, he eyed Daydan. But you can't tell me there's nothing you need, he admonished. Everyone needs something, Daydan shook his head politely. I beg your pardon, tinker. My purse is too thin. How about you? The tinker eyed me up and down. You've the look of a lad who's wanting something. I do need a few things, I admitted, seeing the others look longingly down the road. I motioned them on. Go ahead, I told them. I'll be a few minutes. So fast. As they headed off, the tinker rubbed his hands together, grinning. Well, now, what is it you're looking for? Some salt to begin with. And a box to put it in, in he said as he began to rummage around in his donkey's packs. Like just, I could use a knife, things. too, if you have one that's not too hard to come by. Especially if you're heading north, you got, he said without up. missing a beat. Oh, Dangerous road like that way. Wouldn't do to be without a knife. You see it on the map. Did you have any trouble? I asked, hoping but he I'm might know something you. that could help us find the bandits. Oh, no. He said as he dug through his packs. Oh, wait, hold Things up. aren't so bad that anyone would dream of laying hands on a tinker. Still, it's a bad stretch of road. He produced a long, narrow knife in a leather sheath and handed it to me. Ramston Steel. Like one and a half kilometers is a mile. Yeah, this is basically one and a half. Dun, 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 dun.